Hello and welcome back to A Shot of Wildlife and welcome to Deep Dark Suffolk. Today I've come to Carlton Marshes Reserve which is managed by Suffolk Wildlife Trust and I'm here looking for the Fen Raft Spider. Of course as always I'm going to try to find other wildlife to show you so come on let's check this place out. When I say Deep Dark Suffolk I mean just south of the border from sunny old Norfolk in the River Waveney Valley. Carlton Marshes is made up of a thousand acres of marsh, reed beds and fens and it didn't take long before I saw the first of many dragonflies. There are three mostly red dragonflies in the UK and with its club shaped body this one is a male ruddy darter. He'll be basking here waiting for any females or potential prey to pass by. Oh, he must have seen something. So far, this year hasn't been great for butterflies, but there were quite a few flitting among the pathside vegetation. Most were moving too quick for me to catch on camera, except for this gatekeeper. From this angle, it looks very plain, but when it opened its wings, it looked like a completely different animal. If you look closely, you'll notice a brown line running along the centre of this one's wings. This means it's a male, with the darker markings producing pheromones to hopefully attract females. A short walk down the track, I came to the first hide of the day, but there wasn't any space for me, so I carried on. So far so good, a couple of butterflies and a couple of dragonflies resting. I keep trying to catch a dragonfly in flight on film but me on a Sunday morning versus the UK's fastest flying insect, it's just, it's not really a fair battle. I'll keep trying and hopefully we'll see something a little bit bigger of an insect soon as well. And I definitely will see bigger animals than insects, but not quite yet as the next creature I managed to film was this resting migrant hawker. As their name suggests, migrant hawkers used to be a migratory species, reaching the UK from mainland Europe, but these days a portion of them are resident with breeding populations found over most of southeast England. I was joined by a wildlife guide volunteer for the next part of my route and we didn't get very far before spotting a bird in a nearby tree. This is a linnet and I think it's the first time that I've featured one on this channel. Linnets are often found around farmland, grassland and heathlands, although they are much rarer now than they used to be. They have declined by more than 50% since the 1960s and by 20% in just the last 30 years. By coincidence, like all of the other animals I've shown so far, this one, with its pinky head markings, is also a male. As we walked, we noticed something much smaller crossing the path. This is a great diving beetle and it must be a bit lost, given they are usually found in water. One bit me about 20 years ago when I was pond dipping, and although I still haven't forgiven the species, I did help it out of harm's way before carrying on. The wildlife guide was walking this way to unlock the next hide, but he wasn't in too much of a hurry to show me where he sometimes spots lizards basking in the sun. I love seeing the joy and excitement that wildlife can bring to people, and hopefully these videos are helping to build that connection for some of you watching. Well, I timed that perfectly. If I'd been here any earlier, I wouldn't have been able to get into this hide. Now, the reserve guide has walked off and it means I'm in here on my own. There isn't too much to see at the moment, but there is a brilliant view from here. So hopefully, in the next little while, some birds or maybe even a Chinese water deer will make an appearance. I've only been to Carlton Marshes once before and on that visit I saw plenty of Chinese water deer, but so far I'd only seen distant views of the cattle who grazed the reserve in the summertime. 
Closer into the hide, the local pair of mute swans slowly drifted into view. This is the only species of swan that you are likely to see in the UK during the summer, but every autumn they are joined by two other species, the Hooper and the Buick swan. Although these two are adults, it seems they haven't attempted to breed, or at least they haven't been successful in raising any cygnets this year. Mute swans can breed every year, but they won't if they aren't healthy enough, if one of the established pair dies, or if they aren't able to hold on to a suitable nesting territory. A grey heron briefly flew into view before dipping into the reeds, probably in search of food, whilst higher up, a common kestrel hovered in the breeze. Kestrels have brilliant eyesight, and this one was scanning the reed beds and grass below for any unwitting rodents, small birds or insects. I moved on from the hide, and gradually made my way down a very long track between two ditches. I've never seen a Fenraff spider before, and had been told that these ditches were one of the potential places that I might find one. I stopped at every opening in the reeds to have a look, but it did feel a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Even though they are potentially the largest species of spider in the country, there were plenty of places for them to hide. and they weren't the only animals hiding. I noticed this grey heron skulking among the reeds. When they are hunting, they are capable of staying completely still, although with their white and bluish markings, they're not very well camouflaged, at least not to the human eye. Along the track, there are several raised platforms for viewing across the marshes and into the ditches, and there was some invertebrate activity to see. According to their website, 28 different species of dragonfly and damselfly have been recorded on this reserve, which is crazy. That's pretty much half of all the species that you can find here in the UK. Now, I'm not sure I've seen that many today, but just from this point, I can see quite a few different individuals and potentially a few different species. Most dragonflies change colour as they age, usually getting darker but more colourful as they do so. This is a newly emerged male common data. As he gets older, his body will change to red, like this adult male who was nearby. Dragonflies can survive as adults from anywhere between one week and two months, although most of them die early from starvation or predation. Also here was the first damselfly of the day. Although they are closely related, damselflies can be separated from dragonflies by how they hold their wings back along their body whilst resting, and how their eyes are separated. This one is a male blue-tailed damselfly and is probably waiting for a potential mate to come into view. Quite far in the distance, a little egret was stalking through a hidden shallow pool these will eat anything that they can catch and swallow, with both dragonfly larvae and adults on the menu. That could have been one then. I carried on walking, only stopping briefly to film these whirligig beetles as they cruised the surface of a ditch in search of prey. From here, the path followed a raised flood bank, and although I didn't see any wildlife for a while, it does give me a quick opportunity to ask that if you're enjoying this video, you pop down to the comments afterwards and say hello. It really does help the video to reach more people, and if you'd like to help the channel even more, there's a link to my Patreon in the first comment that you'll see. I was thinking it was getting a bit quiet, but I've just come around a corner and look in the distance. Ooh. You might not be able to see that, but there's a pool over there and there are loads of birds. 
So I know there's a hide a little bit along here. I'm gonna stop there and show you some of the birds. It turns out that the hide was further than I thought, so I stopped shortly along the track to show you the birds. There were quite a few little egrets here, taking some time to keep their feathers and plumes clean. It's amazing they can stay so white, given they spend most of their time wading through the mud and water, but they do have a little bit of help. They have a specially adapted claw, which is similar to a comb, and helps them to brush away any dirt. Several lapwings were here as well. These birds all seem to have quite short crests at the back of their heads, so I presume that they are juveniles from earlier this year. Plenty of gulls lined up along the water's edge, all from the same species, although you wouldn't guess its name from the look of these. These are black-headed gulls, who only have dark-coloured heads throughout the nesting season, and have mostly white heads for the rest of the year. I made it to the next hide, but the reeds in front of it were too high to see anything, so I carried on walking towards a second hide that I could see in the distance. A couple of people have told me there isn't anything to see from this hide, but I found in the past that it's always worth a look, and oftentimes I'm interested in things that other people aren't, so let's see, shall we? And the people who said there was nothing to see here were right. There was actually nothing at all to see from that hide. Not even common species. Um, but, just at the top of this hill, back on the embankment, which I've been walking along, you can see it down there to the pool of water. And if I find an opening, I think there might be a couple of birds out there which I haven't shown you yet. I found an opening, and there was a couple of species I haven't yet shown you both of them non-native. These with their black and white striped heads are Canada geese. They were first introduced to the UK from North America in the 17th century and have gradually colonised the whole of the UK since. You may have noticed the other goose among them, that's an Egyptian goose, and was one of three that I could see near the pool. These have also been here since the 17th century, but have done really well and spread to lots of new parts of the country over the past 20 years. From here, my route took me back along the flood bank towards the centre of the reserve. Alongside the path, a couple of butterflies were resting, including this small tortoise shell. I've only seen this species twice this year, perhaps due to the wet spring we've had, but also down to the steady decline that this species has faced in southern England in recent years. There was a red admiral here too. These are currently the most common species in the country, although 2024 does seem to have been a bad year for them, alongside pretty much all other species of butterfly. I said earlier that I might spot a Chinese water deer and delivered. Take a look down there. In fact, you might even better see it with this camera. Ooh, around here somewhere, but if not, it's definitely on the screen there. Brilliant. As you may have guessed, Chinese water deer are not native to the UK and were first brought to the country in 1896 and first found to be breeding here in the wild in 1945. I would say that in wetland areas, in the east of the country, they are now the species of deer that I see the most. Chinese water deer have a unique feature. Instead of antlers, they have tusks, and in males, they can be quite long. They use them for fighting over females, and that could be how this one lost his right eye. He did seem to be coping okay without it though. Although there is another hide at Carlton Marshes, my trip had already been quite a bit longer than I planned. The past 15 minutes of footage took about 4 hours to film, so I decided to skip the hide on this visit and make my way back towards the visitor centre. I did stop at Spider Bridge, and then, 
in my literal last ditch attempt, I saw this sign and nothing else. Oh well, there's always next time. And that is sadly where today's wildlife walk comes to an end. If you did enjoy it, then have a look at the one on the screen now for more British wildlife. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.